Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Today we are doing a repeat of last week's mission, although today what we are going to do instead is we're going to do it brute force. This massive beast has a huge amount of Delta V, well over 40,000 meters per second. It has a huge number of asparagus staged segments here, and it has got a fairly large iron engine stage at the top just for the extra punch of Delta V that we need. So we want to be as efficient as we can, at the same time as being able to brute force this mission. Now if you recall, the challenge is to do a retrograde solar orbit rescue, which means that we need to first wipe off all of Kerbin's velocity, and then we need to flip our orbit entirely to pick up our very good Kerbal friend, Ted Fry Kerman. Last week, the mission was to do this in the most efficient way possible, which involved uh, heading to Joule, doing all sorts of gravity assist to, uh, to do this in a much more efficient way. We actually did that with a low-tech vessel, so if you want to check that out, check that out here. If you want to brute force it and just play around with this thing in a more interesting and fun way, uh, yes, you can certainly build a vessel like this and just uh, basically take it out using the sheer force of raw Delta V. Doing the mission with such a vessel comes with a pretty hefty cost though. This one in particular cost over 2 million in funds. Now that's pretty extreme. Just ditching that outside ring of mammoth tank engines there. They were feeding into the central core, leaving those completely full at the time we detached those. Did need quite a few separatrons to actually get that thing out cleanly away. Turning fully horizontal there, we want to pick up as much horizontal velocity as we can to uh, make sure that we get to orbit in a nice, efficient way. Now, this vessel at liftoff had a thrust to weight of almost 1.5, which is quite high. It gives us quite a good kick off there off the launch pad. And there go the fairings. So this vessel was over 5,200 tons, so all of those mammoth stages were very, very critical to get the, uh, the massive beast off the launch pad. Of course, if you would like to download the craft file, the craft file I make available, uh, along with all the other craft files from my episodes, uh, down in the description. So yes, uh, feel free to grab this and play around. Uh, I mean, the Delta V in this thing is basically enough to do almost anything. I mean, I can't imagine many situations where you need over 40,000 Delta V. So yes, our burn is complete there. We just need to circularize now. Uh, that's only going to take just a little more Delta V, but you can see here our booster still has quite a bit of fuel remaining. Enough fuel to get us well out of Kerbin's sphere of influence. And that is a very beautiful sunset there as we boost our orbit up above the atmosphere. So Ted Fry Kerman is in a retrograde solar orbit uh, in between Eve and Kerbin. Now what that means is we first need to reverse all of Kerbin's orbital velocity. Now Kerbin alone orbits the sun at almost 9,300 meters per second. Now, we need to uh, basically completely flip that orbit. We need to first remove that 9,300 meters per second, and we need to then add another 8,000 or so meters per second to, uh, to bring our orbit right up in between Eve and Kerbin uh, in a retrograde solar orbit. So it's a massive amount of Delta V just to intercept with Ted Fry Kerman in that little vessel. Just boosting ourselves here out of Kerbin's sphere of influence and uh, ditching that now and we're going to head off using our first set of Nerve rocket motor stages. These are set up in an asparagus stage way and I'm just going to keep burning here using our Nerve rocket motors for quite some time uh, simply so that we can utilize the O-Birth effect and get a little more efficiency out of our uh, ejection here from Kerbin. Because this stage has such a low thrust to weight, we don't want to do too much of this because what it will mean is that over time we'll end up ejecting out of Kerbin's sphere of influence at the wrong angle, enough so to make the O-Birth effect, well, kind of pointless really because uh, we wouldn't be coming out at the right angle. So what we're doing now is we'll complete all of our maneuvers uh, basically from out here in our solar orbit. So at this stage, we still have over 7,300 meters per second of Delta V to wipe off just to basically drop all of our velocity uh, from around the sun. And then we need to reverse this, uh, as I mentioned before. So a huge burn here. 
we have our external field ducts set up here in an asparagus staged uh, kind of way so they're feeding into each other and then they're feeding into the central core so we can ditch two of these at the same time until we fully run out of fuel in this entire segment so as we completely burn through the first set of two tanks here uh, we'll just drop those there <laughs> What I've done here, just to show you how this works, if you haven't done this before, is uh, I've just dragged the uh, the liquid fuel readout down in the bottom right there, so you can tell when it is that I'm going to drop each tank. Obviously, it takes a long time to fully burn all of this fuel with the Nerve rocket motors. Uh, you can see there from the clock in the top left there, we are actually speeding up this video uh, quite a lot, in some cases well over 1,000%. It is probably well worth noting that uh, although this sort of mission is quite unrealistic even in Kerbal Space Program, uh, if you were to try to attempt to do such a thing uh, in real life, you would need to first wipe off 30,000 meters per second uh, from Earth's orbit if you wanted to uh, A, cancel out the velocity of the Earth, uh, and then you'd need to reverse it by about another 30,000 to actually get into a fully retrograde orbit, uh, essentially to come in and collide with the Earth at 60,000 meters per second. And when we're talking such velocity, it is just impossible to do anything like this currently with our uh, existing technology. So you can see there now we have removed all of our orbital velocity. We're now reversing that. We are now well over 1,000 meters per second, uh, heading in a retrograde orbit now. So this is our final tank for this main stage here. Uh, we're almost out of fuel with this one now. You'll see here uh, in total this stage has probably reduced around 10,000 meters per second or so. Uh, so that's a considerable amount for that stage. And of course this next stage is going to be even more efficient because it's got less mass to push forward. So there we go. This last segment here is just about to run out of fuel. And we'll ditch that there. So this whole set of stages is made up of four pairs of detachable boosters. Two of those have Nerve Rocket motors on them. And what we can do is just attach each pair. Uh, there's four pairs total. Uh, and then we have our central core uh, booster there with a Nerve Rocket motor in the center. Now obviously we do not have a Kerbal on board and we need a way to communicate with Kerbin to control this vessel. Uh, and what we have is the Communitron DTS M1. Uh, the reason why I like this, uh, this antenna in particular is because it is fully deployable. So it gives you a very minimal form factor when it's stowed away. That means that uh, you know it's not getting in the way of things too much. And for the most part it can fully uh, communicate with Kerbin. Um, basically anywhere in our orbit with the exception of uh, you know when the Sun is largely in the way So what we're going to do is raise our periapsis until we get a very close encounter with Ted Fry And I'm sure he's going to be very happy about this. He has been very patient He has been waiting for a very long time, but he is let's face it getting quite lonely Not as lonely I will say as Danny Kerman from last week because he was waiting years before we could actually pick him up after doing all sorts of gravity assists with Jewel. The benefit of course of using the brute force method is we can do our mission very quickly in comparison. So before continuing to raise our periapsis we'll just uh, lower our apoapsis so that we're intersecting with Ted Fry's orbit there. And at the same time we can also do a slight inclination change here just to perfectly match that inclination. There we go there. So now what we want to do is time warp around until we meet up here uh, close to Ted Fry. And then we need to reduce all of our uh, velocity uh, in relation to the target. So all this means is we're going to basically turn retrograde towards the target marker. Uh, burn all of that velocity off until we reach zero velocity between the two vessels. Now just to do this we're still over 2000 meters per second. But this is going to uh, pretty much perfectly match our, uh, our orbital path with Ted Fry Kerman. At this point it is just a matter of doing a few small burns just to catch up any distance between us because even though it looks like we're uh, quite close to the target here we are still thousands of kilometers away. Just a few hundred meters per second to burn here now to reduce that target velocity right down to zero and you'll see there as we do this our orbit will basically fall in line automatically. A quick burst now towards the target just so that we can catch up the thousands of kilometers that we are from it. 
So a very slight radial adjustment here. This is just going to mean that we can intersect with our vessel uh, at a later time in the orbital path around the sun. This is uh, really just my attempt at uh, correcting a really rubbish encounter here that I had. I obviously didn't set up that encounter very well. I was still 179,000 kilometers away from the target when I met up with it. So uh, yes, coming in here now finally to meet up with Ted Fry's vessel. After only one year and 75 days, we have finally encountered this. We could have actually caught this a little earlier, perhaps, but uh, compared to last week uh, where we were doing our dual transfers, this was uh, about six years earlier. Out you come, Ted Fry. It is time to go home, finally. We have a very safe vessel for you to board, a vessel that is filled with all of the creature comforts that you desire uh, for your long journey back. There is no expense spared here for you, Ted Fry. I imagine if this vessel were advertised like real estate, we would certainly say that this craft has an open living plan with abundant free space. Not only this, of course, the vessel comes equipped with a personal parachute helmet. No more, Ted Fry, do you need to worry about the dangers of re-entry. This craft is designed to protect you by allowing all dangerous plasma to pass around you slightly out of arm's reach. We do, of course, pride ourselves on everything we do to ensure safety. So after accepting all of the terms and conditions in the real estate contract, Ted Fry is now on the way back to Kerbin. We need to now uh, reduce all of this velocity around the sun. We need to reverse the orbit again. So a huge burn here. All of the fuel in those last two side tanks there, almost, uh, almost depleted now. We'll get rid of this. The final nerve rocket motor core here will give us around another 4,800 delta V before we detach that. That's going to almost drop us there into the sun, not quite. Uh, and then we can use that uh, ion engine stage to get us all the way back to Kerbin. The ion engine stage itself has a huge amount of delta V to it. Although those little tanks don't seem very large, we have 12,000, over 12,000 Delta V available to us with this one stage. Uh, it is slow going though, I will say. It takes a long time to burn this velocity. It's a good thing we have these very large solar panels. Uh, we do need those to make sure that we get the maximum thrust out of those two side ion engines. So you can see with the clock in the top right there, this is hugely accelerated footage. This is around 6,000% speed. Uh, and I was actually running with physics warp going as fast as possible there on that four times speed. Now what I'm doing here is raising the periapsis just until I can get a uh, encounter set up with Kerbin on the opposite side. What we want to do is stretch the apoapsis up to meet up with Kerbin uh, and not completely bring our periapsis right up to Kerbin's orbit. Uh, that would be kind of just a waste of, uh, of energy really. We can actually uh, re-enter at Kerbin at a reasonable velocity with our heat shield here. So uh, yes, just raising that periapsis just above Moho's orbit. It is very handy placing multiple manoeuvre nodes like this. You can really simulate what your uh, trajectory is going to be at certain points as you raise your periapsis. That helps you uh, plan your intercepts with other bodies without uh, spending too much Delta V mucking around. Just a small normal adjustment there at our descending node just to completely wipe off any of our inclination difference with Kerb and that's going to mean we can come in quite nicely around the equatorial plane. And just finalizing that encounter there with Kerb and leaving us with well over 1800 meters per second of Delta V left in this ion engine stage. So with the encounter set up, we'll time warp all the way into Kerbin's sphere of influence and make a slight radial adjustment just so we're coming in uh, into the atmosphere at around 30 kilometers. As we hurtle into Kerbin at over 3,500 meters per second, Ted Fry is starting to uh, get a little nervous. Uh, I think we're going to re-enter this uh, and probably spin uh, spin Ted Fry like a roast chicken. I think that's probably the best way to ensure that uh, he is evenly roasted on all sides. Certainly, Ted Fry, keep your arms and legs inside the vessel at all times. Due to the very low mass of this re-entry vehicle, you can see there we are wiping off velocity extremely quickly. So uh, we could have actually uh, re-entered here at uh, probably a much higher speed. So with the most scorchy part of our re-entry now over, we can fall uh, nice and harmlessly down through the atmosphere, ready now to deploy our parachute helmet. 
And as soon as that deploys, you can see our server speed now is around 4 meters per second. So uh, yes, there is going to be no destruction upon hitting the ground with this one. So there you go, Ted Fry. You are back safe on the surface of Kerbin. I don't know what you were worried about all this time. Uh, he did express many times that he was not sure if this re-entry vehicle was designed in such a way to uh, bring him safely back to Kerbin. But uh, his primary concern right now is to just get a little private time. It has been almost two years now since he has been able to relieve himself outside of his spacesuit. And that tree over there is looking now very inviting. <laughs> So for all of you that would like to win a flag at the Minmus base, uh, what I'm going to do is award an extra flag this week uh, to one of the comments, basically. Uh, I will just randomly choose a comment and then I'll just private message you through YouTube and you can win a flag that way. So all you have to do is leave a comment. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Please do take a second and give this video a thumbs up or even a thumbs down if you uh, didn't like it, of course. Uh, all of the support there helps a huge amount. It helps me build this channel. Uh, all of the engagement uh, is, is just wonderful and uh, thank you very much to all of you that have subscribed. For those that haven't yet, please do subscribe to see more of my content. You can also follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we will see you in the next video. checking out a game called Stable Orbit and we are also joined by a very good friend of mine, Mark Thrym. How are you going, Mark? Hello, I'm great, I'm great. Um, so tell us, Marcus, what are we doing here today? Because judging by the looks, we are in charge of a space station, right? So yes, in this game, the year is 2034.